Panic at the Disco is one of my favorite bands, so I've been following them for a long time. Not as long as the original release of A Fever You Can't Sweat Out, but I certainly didn't start with Pray for the Wicked. While I was fortunate enough to see them on the Pray for the Wicked tour, I've actually been listening to Panic since 2011 when Vices and Virtues released. Looking back though, there was one album that always confused me for its seemingly out of place composition along with the rest of Panic's music at the time. While Vices and Virtues was made without many of the original band members who were present for Fever, I could still hear the similarities in tone between the two albums. But pretty odd, the album in between acted more like a gap in the band's discography rather than a bridge of evolution, and I just didn't understand why it was so different. But there actually is a reason. We're going to take a look at the album that was in production between Fever and Pretty Odd, an entire album that was scrapped, never seeing the light of day, and never being released. Well, kinda. The story begins shortly after the band had finished touring for Fever in late 2006. In February 2007, Ryan Ross had begun the early phases of penning some new lyrics for the band's second album, which would begin heavy production in March of 2007. Though Panic didn't go about this production in the conventional way that most bands would. They instead chose to head to a cabin, an old ski lodge actually, which was located in the humble Toyabe National Forest, 45 minutes away from their hometown of Las Vegas. The cabin was in complete seclusion, with the band having stayed there for three months. Despite this seclusion, the cabin itself was modern, with each band member having their own separate rooms and privacy. So while this space was not exactly conventional, it was the perfect setting for the band to create what they wanted their second album to sound like, and thus began this album as we know it. Cricket and Clover told the story of a doomed love affair between the two titular characters, and at its core, was supposed to tell a story as one song would lead into the next. It's often compared to the likes of a fairy tale for not only its storytelling element, but also for its musical composition. It featured a much more experimental and free-flowing style of music. The song structures were really bizarre. There were no choruses, just parts that didn't repeat, producer Rob Mathis recalls. Ryan was also obsessed with film soundtracks at the time, including Bernard Herrmann's Hitchcock and Danny Elfman. In fact, the band wasn't sure they even wanted to use real instruments. Mathis recalls Spencer wanting to build a hybrid drum kit out of glass, egg crates, and wood cartons. Ryan would listen to the arrangements Mathis wrote up and said to hell with our guitars, as more point to keep the music sounding as strange as it could. Even Pete Wentz from Fall Out Boy described some of the songs as a film score, then it turns into Beatles 2007. All in all, these first-hand accounts of the song's sound paint a pretty good picture just how experimental and different the album was going to be, but why exactly did it fall apart when things seemed to be going so well? Well, contrary to popular belief, the scrapping of the album was not the result of the band members going crazy, though they did admit to getting cabin fever. But the downfall of the album came more from the fact that Panic was trying to do too much with it and make it too perfect. When it came time to record for the album, co-producer Kevin Aganis put a lot of pressure on the band to have them finish the album, and while there was no deadline, the record label wanted the songs done. With the huge vision that the band had for the album seeming unachievable, they made the decision that it had to be remade. Ryan sums it up really well when he says, If it were up to us, I think we would have written forever and it never would have been finished. So after the framework for Cricket and Clover was scrapped, the first song the band produced that summer was Nine in the Afternoon, and from there continued production on what would become known as Pretty Odd. While Rob Mathis was all for experimentation, looking back he realizes that Cricket and Clover was to a fault, and it was too ambiguous. But this is only half of the story, the history and production of the album. What happened to all of those amazingly imperfect tunes that were crafted from a cabin in the middle of nowhere? Well, this is where the real excitement is, and where the actual search for this lost media begins. Let me start by saying Cricket and Clover in its purest form does not exist. Mathis confirms this by saying, there's no holy grail of reel-to-reel -reel tape sitting in someone's basement. I wish there were. But that doesn't mean we can't reconstruct Cricket and Clover in our own way, because there is stuff from the album floating around out there, we just need to collect it. One of my first objectives was sourcing these song names mentioned in a Reddit post talking about the album. I had never heard of them before, though apparently they came from a Kerrang! magazine. So luckily I was able to track down this magazine from the UK pretty quickly to check to see if these songs were mentioned. And amazingly they were. The song titles mentioned include There Was Once a Man from Nantucket, Folkin' Around, I Don't Have a Shirt But I've Got a Hat, Fill Me Up, and Porridge which loosely connect in the track listing to create Fill Me Up With Porridge. 
That's a whopping 5 songs and we haven't even scratched the surface yet. But you'll probably notice something interesting about Folkin Around, and that's because the song can actually be found as a track on Pretty Odd. However, as far as I know, the title is the only similarity this song shares. Rob Mathis confirms that some Crooked and Clover elements were carried over into Pretty Odd, but we'll come back to that later. On the contrary, a song that did see the light of day from Cricket and Clover was Nearly Witches. The early demo that differs from the final version on Vices and Virtues can be heard on YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, if you dig a little deeper into Panic's rarities, you'll find a song called It's True Love that they would play at live shows in the summer of 2007, right around the time Cricket and Clover was scrapped no less. This song has never appeared in any other way, it even fits into the love theme that Cricket and Clover was about. So far that's 7 songs, but this is when things get a little sketchy. I'm not a fan of wikis to any extent, but it is worth noting that the Panic Wiki has a screenshot of 3 lyric sheets allegedly from Ryan Ross while he was writing for Cricket and Clover. While you can kinda read the lyrics on the page, the songs don't have titles, so if we assume they are legit, I'm not sure if these are new songs or lyrics to songs that we got from the Kerrang! magazine. At any rate, I don't believe they're legit, since Ryan has gone on record with AP Magazine before, saying, I don't have anything, all those computers of mine are long gone, I don't even have any of the lyric books. But perhaps one of the most interesting elements to tracking down Crooked and Clover lost material comes from Brendan himself. In a Q&A session from Periscope from 2015 that was reposted to YouTube, Brendan gets asked if he has anything from Crooked and Clover, to which he responds with, Do I still have anything from Cricket and Clover? The Cabin album? I don't have that stuff, but we have it on a hard drive, yeah. It's somewhere. So if Brendan is being straight with us, then something from Cricket and Clover that we have yet to unearth exists somewhere on a hard drive. Curiously, if we go back to the AP interview, Ryan says, I went digging through all my stuff trying to find something, but it's not there. If anybody's got it, I'd love to hear it. That about does it for material that's straight from Cricket that found its way out of the cabin though I do want to go back to my point about mentioning cricket elements that were used in Pretty Odd. Like I said earlier, the name Falcon Around was taken straight from cricket, and AP confirms that Behind the Sea carried over some elements too. But I think some of the most interesting overlap in the two albums comes from the lyrics of Pretty Odd themselves. There are a lot of references in the album that allude to the time in the cabin, including lyrics from We're So Starving. Of course, the song title, From a Mountain in the Middle of the Cabins, and the mention of Beards at the beginning of The Piano Knows Something I Don't, which could be a reference to the beard off the band had while living in the cabin. At the end of the day though, I'm glad we got pretty odd over Cricket and Clover, as it sounds like it would have just been way too different of an album to sustain Panic's popularity. Ryan admits they didn't make a conscious effort to make a different sounding record, but that after playing nearly 400 shows for Fever, they wanted to prove that they had become better musicians over the years. But sometimes creativity has its limits, and in the case of Cricket being scrapped in almost its entirety, proves just that. And maybe by the next time I see Panic in concert, something will have surfaced. But until that happens, Panic at the Disco's Cricket and Clover album will remain a mystery.